The next panel is called Cybersecurity, Climate, and More, and goes into the SEC's rulemaking agenda and its impact on issuers and regulated entities. And uh, very pleased to welcome uh, Rob Cohen, who is in the middle there, uh, partner at Davis Polk in Washington, D.C., and the former chief of the SEC's cyber unit. Welcome, Rob. Uh, to, let's see, oh, to, uh, two over for me uh, is Steve Cohen, partner at Sidley Austin in D.C. Uh, Steve previously served for 12 years at the SEC, most recently as associate director in the enforcement division. Our moderator, uh, immediately to my left, is Kaz Hashemi. Kaz is a partner at Wilson Sonsini in the Palo Alto office and also uh, former counsel in the SEC's division of enforcement. Welcome, Kaz, and thank you for moderating. Our uh, SEC representative today is Melissa Hodgman. She is associate director in the enforcement division. She joined the SEC in 2008 and was one of the first members of the market abuse unit. Thank you for joining us today. Finally, uh, Jay Spinella at the far end of the stage. He's a senior managing director at FTI Consulting in Washington, D.C., and a former member of the staff in the SEC's Division of uh, Corpor Corporation Finance. Welcome, Jay, and let me turn it to you, Kaz. Thanks, Bruce. As we all know, the Commission has been quite active recently in rulemaking and finalized some important rules uh, focused on several areas, but the ones that have gotten a lot of attention recently include cybersecurity, climate, and ESG, and a few other topics. On this panel, we're going to discuss how these rules raise issues of first impression and novel issues and try to dig into it with our excellent panel. So, Melissa, we'll start with you in cybersecurity. In July of this year, the SEC approved a significant set of final rules related to cybersecurity risks and incidents. Um, after giving your disclaimer, can you kind of summarize for <laughs> us the key takeaways? Coming. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I am appearing uh, as an associate director of the Division of Enforcement, but you can't blame anybody there for whatever I might say this afternoon. Um, so yeah, we, we have had a number of rulemakings this year, and I think cyber is one of the largest and one of the ones that I think people are most interested in talking about. I would say that what the rule did was uh, put into practice the kind of two areas that we've been talking and thinking about a lot at the Commission. One is incident reporting, cyber incident reporting, and the other is cyber hygiene. And I think that's the intention behind the rule. And I'll go into a couple of details, but everybody can read it, so I don't want to spend too much time on what the specifics are. But with regard to reporting, the rule makes clear that within four days of determining that you've had a material cyber event, you have to file, four business days by the way, uh, you have to file a, uh, an 8K that gives all of the important specifics with regard to it that any investor would want to know. Uh, the second piece is that annually there has to be reporting with regard to how you're taking care of your governance. What is your board oversight? What is your risk stature, uh, status and how you are managing your risk within, the, uh, uh, within your entity? Um, and so I think it's a pretty straightforward rule. I think it's consistent with uh, longstanding policies of requiring disclosure when something becomes very important to investors, to boards, to others. And I think it's just one of those natural evolutions. We'll be talking about that with regard to ESG as well, but I think that's a theme that you're going to hear from me this afternoon. Rob, you bring a unique perspective, um, being the former head of the unit and now on the defense side. Um, what are your key takeaways? Is it a pretty straightforward rule? as Melissa just said? Um, I'd say the rule's straightforward. The implications, maybe less so. Um, so there's a lot to talk about the rule. Two takeaways to start with. One is materiality. The number one topic under this rule is materiality, as Melissa said, and we would agree. The law has always been that material events or risks need to be disclosed. So some might ask, why do you need a rule on cybersecurity? It's already covered. And I think what's this is my opinion, it's not necessarily in the adopting release entirely, but I think what's motivating it is a disagreement between the commission staff and not necessarily enforcement, um, but commission staff and um, you know the industry, cybersecurity experts, defense lawyers, et cetera. And that disagreement is how often cybersecurity incidents are material under the securities laws. Right, the rule and the release does not purport to change the law of materiality. So the law is the same, what would a reasonable investor want to know when buying or selling a security? Um, cybersecurity events are routine. Serious cybersecurity events are routine. I haven't worked for the government for four years and I still get notices from the government 
saying that my personal information has been compromised and I may want to check my credit report. I'm sure everybody in that room, in the room, gets those notices. That's serious, but serious is not the same thing as materiality under the securities laws. And so what you see in the both proposing release and adopting release is a concern from the staff uh, or from the commission. It's a commission document, the releases. A concern from the commission that material cybersecurity events are not being reported. Um, and there isn't a lot of evidence to back that up. There's a reference to cybersecurity events being reported in the news, but not disclosed by companies. Of course, that's not the law. Something that's in the news is not necessarily material from, from a securities law perspective. In fact, probably most things in the news are not material. And so, and I think the experience, and, and as, as you said now that I've worked on this side for, for a number of years, there's a lot of cybersecurity events that are very serious, and companies take them very seriously, but they're not material under the securities laws. C certainly some are, but a lot, of them, a lot of them are not, even a ransomware event, right? Companies take this very seriously. Big public companies have been preparing for these issues for years. And you know, let's say hypothetically there's an event, um, it has a real impact, but the company recovers within a couple weeks, let's say, no impact on quarterly financial performance. Uh, they reach out to their customers. The customers are fine with what happened, so no impact to customer relationships. Um, no impact to public reputation. It's a routine cybersecurity event. So it's, so it's serious, but it's not material. Um, no, impact, no material impact on operations, financial performance, customer relationships, public reputation. It's not material. But I think sort of the key takeaway from this rule is there's a view, I think, at the commission that led to the rule, at least in part, that no, these things really are material. And without changing the law, which I don't think the commission can do, um, trying to encourage more of, these, more of these to be disclosed. And I think that's sort of the number one takeaway is that, is that tension. Clearly, the commission wants more things disclosed, but I think that's practically conventional wisdom within the, within the industry and the bar and among cybersecurity experts that many, many, many cybersecurity events are not material. Some are, but many are not. How do you approach close calls? And who's best positioned to make that determination about materiality? So I think the company is advised by their counsel and their cybersecurity experts are in the best position, right? Um, something we've probably heard earlier today and we'll talk more about, I think, on this panel is it's not one size fits all. So a lot depends on the company, the nature of their business, whether having a cybersecurity incident really matters to investors, even if the company recovers well. So, um, and having worked on these, the, the company reaches out to their customers and their suppliers and their key partners, and you know they know whether those constituents view this as a big deal. Their experts are advising them on whether um, you know their defenses are what they should be or if they need to be improved. I, I think the company is in the best position. Obviously, nobody wants to get sued, so they are on the side of disclosure. But um, I don't think that means all these events are actually material. Well, so what do you think of Rob's very reasonable interpretation of materiality? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was more reasonable when I worked for him. Uh, no. You always uh, say that. <laughs> you always say that, but people know I was a supervisor, but I worked for you. <laughs> oh. I didn't know that. Um, so uh, unfortunately, what we see all too often are people who aren't disclosing it to their customers, people who are afraid of reputational risk and as a result of that are making decisions, or who have set up their systems so that information doesn't flow to the people who are making disclosure decisions. And so those are the cases that I think we see too many of and that we see patterns of in the market. And we don't want to have to investigate anymore. And we're hoping the rule means that we'll have fewer of these to look at and to investigate. But we often see situations, and we're going to talk about one in a moment, or we could talk about Pearson or, or another case, in which the information doesn't flow up or to the person who's making the disclosure information. We can't have faith then that counsel's even being advised or and, you know, having that conversation. Um, we also see instances in which it is material and it comes out later, and the stock price shows the, the hit when, when the information comes out and shows that people aren't making the decisions the way they need to. Um, I think Rob did a nice job of running through the kinds of things that companies has to think, have to think about, though, in making this determination. It's not just you know, financially 
did this hit you, but it is that reputation. It is your customer base and are people going to have faith in you going forward and things like that. And I think that that's very helpful in this role because I think, yes, many issuers and many of you out here look at those issues and making your determinations as to whether or not disclosures required, but unfortunately, others have not been. Rob, do you see any of the changes from the proposed rules to the final rules uh, as beneficial? Yeah, there were some sig uh, significant, really significant changes from the proposing uh, release to the final rule. Um, two, and, and they're very good changes, and two in particular. One has to do with timing. Melissa mentioned the four days. It's four days from a determination that the event was material. It's not four days from the event. It's four days from the determination the event was material, which from personal experience I can say can take time. It's complicated and the facts take time to emerge. Um, and so there had been, in the proposing release, a principle that companies need to make that determination as soon as reasonably practicable. Uh, and reasonably sounds reasonable, but <laughs> that concept just put a lot of pressure, companies felt that was gonna put a lot of pressure on them to make a complicated decision maybe before they were really ready to. And the commission responded to that feedback and changed it from as soon as reasonably practicable to, I think it's without unreasonable delay. Mm -hmm. So instead of a affirmative obligation, mm -hmm. it's don't do something bad, right? Like, and, and there's examples in the release that are very helpful. You know, if you have a normal meeting where you would discuss this, don't postpone it, <laughs> you know, for the sake of delaying mm -hmm. the decision. So, right. so that, was, uh, that was very helpful. The other positive was the proposing release um, essentially required cybersecurity expertise on the board with some very precise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. qualifications. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of resistance to that, what was perceived as micromanagement of board composition. And there's a million things that need to be represented on a board mm -hmm. and to take up one spot with this one very specific type of expertise mm -hmm. got a lot of objection and the commission responded to that and essentially took that out. Let's get one. the other I, Cohen in here. Yeah, I was just going to add one. I think I, I also, if I'm, I'm looking for things that were improved, I think it's probably important to note that a lot of commentators were worried about the amount of information that companies might be required to disclose, technical information about cybersecurity at their companies. And I think the commission also took that to heart and, and really limited that information, which did, I think that was a wise decision. And the other thing I'll add is there is a process for national security and public safety um, if there's a reason not to disclose within the time frame. And so the AG can send in a writing that can delay that. Um, I think that's another important piece of this. The commission was very thoughtful in the way that it put this together in thinking about how all of these pieces can interact with each other and, and cause issues. And so seeing polite, uh, and it's great the commission took that seriously, there's real um, industry questions, I'd say, to see how this plays out, right? The rule says you need a, you need the Attorney General of the United States of America to weigh in and say there is a national security risk from you disclosing this information. And if that's the case, I think he can delay it like 30 or 60 days or get an extension. So I think most clients are wondering how often the United States Attorney General is going to think there's a national security risk from their own disclosure. Certainly some companies, but that quickly. That, many, that, yeah. And if, 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 yeah. if a company gets yeah. that, that they'll be able to get a determination. Right. Uh, and in fairness, it shows the commission was sensitive to the issue. It wanted to address it and work with the Department of Justice, and, and that's great. Yeah, I, I think some people were hoping that, um, particularly since so many of these, particularly material, what I would call material, cyber breaches do involve law enforcement, do involve the FBI, Homeland Security, and a myriad of other agencies that maybe um, uh, a letter from someone below the Attorney General would, would, would at least delay the rule, if it's in the national security, again, I agree with Rob and Melissa, definitely shows that there was some sensitivity to the issue. I think we'll have to see how it plays out as to whether it landed in a place that, that, that's practical for, for purposes of appropriate delays when there are national security issues. Steve, anything you want to add on how these rules are playing out with your clients, uh, materiality or other concepts that you've been kind of focused on? Uh, I, I mean, the, before we talk about enforcement risk, I think um, and the enforcement risk. <laughs> well, well, I think a, a lot of companies are concerned that, look, Rob said it very well, which is that from a 
disclosure perspective, the law was already, I mean, they brought the Yahoo case, they brought other cases. The law arguably was sufficient um, to bring cases where companies don't disclose material events. And I think what some companies are worried about, um, these incidents, as many people in the room already know, are just incredibly difficult situations for companies. I actually find it very, I, that was an interesting observation from Melissa. It does surprise me to hear that um, where there are at least material cyber breaches, there's not information flow to the right people. It's, that's, it, I don't clearly see what, what you see um, in, in that volume, but that's, that is certainly wouldn't be my observation. I think cyber breaches at, at companies and financial institutions are taken extraordinarily seriously, and almost by necessity when you start bringing in um, you vendors and others to look at things, it involved, and the incident response plans, uh, do necessarily require relevant people to be brought into the mix, and, and materiality determinations for disclosure are part of the current framework for companies, even pre-rule. Um, and you see that, uh, obviously, in myriad disclosures in the marketplace. I think some people are worried that once you start putting particularized rules in place, they become, even with the best of intentions, tailor-made for enforcement um, through hindsight risk, right? And I'm not remotely ascribing motive to the staff. I'm not suggesting that's the aim, or that, that, that staff open the investigations with that intention. But what necessarily happens is you get a year or two into an investigation, um, and you are looking at the facts as they played out 12 and 24 months after the people were acting uh, uh, most often in good faith, trying to come to a good determination. And I think, uh, you know, Rob was pointing out um, this issue of, of determining mat materiality, um, and once you determine it, you have four days um, without un unreasonable delay. Um, definitely agree, that was a, a terrific decision by the commission to change that standard, um, but I think some folks are concerned that that still leaves um, really judgment by the commission staff as to whether they agree or disagree um, as to, to um, you know, whether those events constituted un unreasonable delay, and of course, whether whether the event was material um, in the first place. So, um, I, I'm, and then the last thing I'll just say on that is, um, when the commission puts rules into place, um, there is usually a desire to enforce them appropriately, um, as they should. Rules should be um, put into place and to show that they have a purpose that are generally um, enforced. Um, I think there's going to be, you know, it'll be interesting to see, I think, in the first year or two after mm -hmm. the rule is in place. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to learn what constitutes unreasonable delay and mm -hmm. what constitutes material. We, we all, you know, hopefully will ag agree um, you know what that what that standard is. Um, so I think that's I think that's principally. I guess the last thing I just will say is um, I, I do think um, what I hear from some of my clients is that the the sort of what I'll just call the Covington situation mm -hmm. that that case mm -hmm. has concerned people about the nature of the requests that mm -hmm. the commission might seek mm -hmm. and the extent of the information that they might be looking for for the purpose of opening investigations around cyber disclosures. I'm not ascribing, I'm, again, I'm not putting a value judgment on that for purposes of this panel, but mm -hmm. I, I am observing that that has people concerned. Right. Um, and I think this, it, it is against that backdrop that I think people are, are a little bit concerned about mm -hmm. um, enforcement of, of the new rule. Thank you. Jay, why don't you jump in from an accountant's perspective? And yeah, I think uh, from an accounting's perspective, I think we tend to think of things in terms of process and documentation. And we had a great discussion here, I think, around materiality and you know some of the concepts that go into qualitative and quantitative analysis. <clears throat> the key thing to me in this, given the really tight time frames that we're talking about with an incident response, is contemporaneous documentation. Because I always say, if you've got contemporaneous documentation, kind of regardless of the issue, you've got high ground. If you've prepared that documentation in good fa faith, uh, you've put your thoughts down on paper and included various stakeholders, accounting, IT in this case, legal, outside counsel, audit committee, potentially a cyber expert. Uh, you're really well positioned at that point if you get a question back from a regulator or somebody else down the road questioning why potentially you had an incident but it wasn't 8 k as material. I think that's a really important thing to think about is that documentation real time. 
And Melissa, there was a case in March of this year, I think you referenced it earlier, the Black Bod case. Would you mind summarizing that for us? And then I'm going to sure. turn over to Rob and Steve. To so this is the Black Bod case, and this is one of the instances in which information didn't flow as it should. And we're very worried at the commission about the hear no evil, see no evil, disclose no evil kind of approach to cybersecurity. Um, and in this case, uh, information was known, and it did not flow up to senior executives. As a matter of fact, it took a number of months for the true information to come out with regard to it. Initially, it was minimized, and then it was, they didn't get social security numbers or bank account numbers, and then it was, oh, actually, they did. Um, and this is the type of situation that we see too often, where we have a 13A15 charge, because you didn't have the internal policies and procedures that make sure that the decision makers, the people who know what needs to be disclosed, were getting the information they had. They didn't have the type of documentation Jay was suggesting that people have. They didn't follow that kind of a process or set it up. And so I think that um, in that case, there was also 17A2 and 3 because of some of the statements. Um, I think that that is what we're looking at now in a number of cases and where I think this rule will help companies to better position themselves to have the procedures in place so that we don't end up with false statements into the marketplace or a lack of disclosure and omission type of situation. So Rob and Steve, as defense counsel, why don't you jump in? Melissa just said you know they're looking at that in some of these cases. What should defense counsel, what are your expectations in the SEC's cybersecurity enforcement in the future? I, I don't think there's any question that the commission's focused on, on controls. Um, and I think, as, as Melissa said, the, the, I think in some regards the case is interesting, in some regards it's straightforward, right? I think the extent to which uh, you know, there, were, there was information disseminated about a breach that then it turns out um, the, the, the company had information that went in a different direction, that, that does sort of fall in the fairway of, of commission cases. I, I would, it, what I would want to focus on is the, the observation, and I, it's an interesting one to think about, whether the rules make a difference, right? So if there's a misleading disclosure, 17, 18, and 3 were used. Um, I, I'd note what I thought was sort of interesting is it, the, the, the case also brought something that's pretty typical for the commission, which is the use of the phrase hypothetical as opposed to actual, which is they disclosed that maybe they have incidents when they actually had an incident. And I think that's also a traditional one that we've seen before year over year. Um, but I, I do think on, in this area, the commission has shown a propensity to bring dis, uh, disclosure controls cases as it relates to cybersecurity without a new rule. And so um, while, so I, I think, I am, it's interesting to think about whether the rule aids this or whether the existing disclosure controls are sufficient uh, along with you know, 10B, 17A to 17A3 if, if a company doesn't fairly or adequately disclose cybersecurity risks. Um, Rob? Yeah, so Melissa mentioned disclosure controls and, and 13A15, that's, that's a rule that's been on the books for a while and that's been an existing risk enforcement risk that, and it's not just cybersecurity specific, it's, it's anything, but cybersecurity is a prominent example. The companies are required to have a funnel, I describe it as a funnel, to get information from throughout the company up to the executives making disclosure decisions so they can make a good decision. So that's not new. I think what's new about the rule and what really increases the surface area of enforcement risk are, um, I think what Melissa described as the, the cyber hygiene part of the rule, which is the annual disclosure in a 10K about your cybersecurity policies, that's really a new disclosure requirement. And I think the, the new enforcement risk is putting aside whether an event was material and should or should not have been disclosed. Um, with the next round of 10Ks, uh, the commission's now gonna have a whole set of company public statements about how they handle these events. And I would expect that to be a major focus of enforcement after potential events during investigations, which is Okay, one part is whether this event was material and you should have disclosed it, but putting that aside, and even if it wasn't material, company discloses in their 10K a whole bunch of procedures. Well, did you do it, right? So I think companies should go through the exercise of saying, okay, what we, and, and they're writing them right now. Um, the, the, the disclosure requirement is kicking in right now. So when you disclose how you handle cybersecurity incidents, and then you experience an event, does it line up? because that's what the staff's gonna look at. They're gonna say, okay, you said you do X, Y, Z. Let me see if you really did X, Y, Z. 
And I think that's something that we're looking at broadly, and I think that's a good point, not just in, in cyber, but everywhere. Did you develop policies and procedures that are appropriate to your business model? Do they indeed meet the risks that you have identified? And are you looking at them? You know, you don't just make them once and put them on the shelf. That, that's something that, that we've seen in this area as well. You, you create something and then your business grows or the interest in your business grows from hackers or, or others. You have to be responsive to the risk environment in which you find yourself and be regularly evaluating these. And then do you actually enforce them? Do you go forward? Does the information flow up in the funnel that you described or not? Um, I think those are all key things that we have to make sure that we're doing in the cyber area but elsewhere. I think one, just one, one, maybe one thing to add on to what, what Rob and Melissa were saying that's a little different here is when you think about the SEC um, looking at how a firm um, handles, discloses, and or um, enforces their policies and procedures in the investment advisor space, that's a core expertise of the commission. They, hopefully we can all agree on that. Broker dealers, NRSROs, that really is what they do. I think what some commentators said in the rule, and I think what some people are concerned about is, this is a little di different for the commission to be looking at, uh, I think the way Melissa framed it, like what are your business risks and whether your cybersecurity um, controls are sufficient to address those risks. I just, uh, it's a little different, I think, in the cybersecurity area, which is not a core expertise, I think, of, of the SEC. So I, I just wanna be clear, because I may have misspoken, it's the risks you identify and articulate. You, your business identifies and articulates and whether or not those are the things that you're addressing. Because what we're seeing sometimes is a mismatch from policy to risk disclosure. And those do need to align with each other. We're, we're not in the business of determining what your risks are or what your client's risks are. It really is, are you lining up what, it, you, what you're facing? And if you have a change in your risk disclosure, have you looked at your policies and procedures as a result of that? But, but will the commission, will the enforcement staff be looking at the policies and procedures that purport to address the risk. I understand that you, the commission's on the risk identification business, but will they be looking at the policies and procedures and assessing with a value judgment? I don't think these policies and procedures are sufficient to address the risks you identified. That is at least in part a cybersecurity question. That's That was the, the point I was making. I, I don't see it coming up that way, um, and that's not the approach that we take. I, I think what we normally see is somebody talking about the risks they have and no change in policy or Procedure. I think it's 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 a mismatch that that the company itself, if they looked inside their own communications, would see for themselves. Very helpful. All right, let's move on to climate. <laughs> nice transition. In March of 2022, Steve, uh, the commission proposed some rules, um, climate-related disclosures. Uh, given its impact, it got a lot of attention from lawyers and companies. I think Chair Gensler recently said they received over 16,000 comments. From a defense perspective, what are some of the key takeaways and concerns? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we're, we're waiting to see where the commission lands on this. I think there's been a lot of discussion about it. There's been a lot of discussion about if, they, if the industry were to land uh, sorry, if the commission were to land where the proposed rule is, whether that's likely to generate um, litigation. So I think people are, are waiting to see. I think there have been some concerns expressed that at least as drafted in the proposed release, um, the, the rule would potentially exceed the commission's authority. I have little doubt, particularly there's been a lot of deliberation going on and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there will be changes. Uh, not, you know, what they look like, we don't know. Look, I think um, from an enforcement perspective, at least the way I think about it is, um, well, let, let just really one more other thing. I think if we're talking about, you know, what level of greenhouse gas emission disclosures ought to be required by certain companies, I think a lot of ink has been spilled over whether the commission is going to go scope three versus scope one, scope two. Again, that, that kind of dovetails a little bit maybe on what I was saying before about the question of what, where the commission really wants to be. Um, on ESG rules and how far it wants to go to prescribe what needs to be disclosed at different levels. I know a lot of us are going to be watching, for example, um, and we may hear more about this, uh, where they're going to land on financial statement thresholds. I think that's going to be a significant issue um, for a lot of companies. But really the point on ESG rules, depending where they land, is similar to cybersecurity in the following. Maybe it's a little bit more acute, which is um, it certainly creates um, uh, enforcement risk away from uh, you know, what arguably is the SEC's core mission, which is to say there's no question that today if a company discloses its, its intentions and how it's going to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions 
um, reduce its carbon footprint, get to zero in 20 years. Um, and those statements are false, the SEC, um, and, and that's material to the company that the SEC has tools in the toolbox to bring that case. And we've certainly seen instances where the Commission's gone after companies and financial services firms for false and misleading statements. Um, but this would be slightly different because it's going to uh, potentially create a number of um, prescribed disclosure rules, which, again, would leave uh, the possibility of the agency looking at how, what and how those things are disclosed. Of course, they need to be disclosed accurately and properly, um, but new, I'll call it opportunity, um, for, for enforcement risk as I think folks uh, look at those disclosure, uh, disclosures and see whether um, those obligations have been met. Rob, there was a, uh, a dissenting commissioner, a strongly worded dissent. What were some of the key concerns raised in that dissent and any views you have on it? Yeah, and so there was discussion earlier about the number of dissents uh, we now see. Uh, and so Commissioner Peirce not only wrote a dissent, but it was a real, like, brief practically. It wasn't just, I disagree for the following reasons. It was long, detailed, extraordinarily substantive. Um, and I think the main theme is captured in the title, which is we are not the title of the dissent. Uh, we are not the Securities and Environment Commission, at least not yet. And so high-level points of disagreement. Um, one, Commissioner Peirce thought the rules would be ineffective, and that largely, I think, she views as a result of the commission not having expertise in this area. Right. So following uh, the point we talked about for cyber, but um, compared to the cyber rule, the potential climate disclosure rule is just intensely detailed. Um, I mean, level two, level three, like, do people even know what that is? Like, incredibly detailed. Uh, and I think Commissioner Peirce's view is the commission has no business or no core competency making those types of decisions. And as a result, it's one-size-fit-all type rules about this very complicated science, really, that is changing. And at the end of the day, that's just not going to help investors make decisions about whether to buy or sell um, a company's securities. I think the second sort of broad um, uh, broad concept, uh, very much related, is whether the Commission really has the authority to, to adopt these rules, right? The concept that um, not just the SEC, but that um, regulatory agencies um, do not necessarily have the authority to adopt some of the rules they're adopting has gotten a lot of traction in the courts, right? Again, not, not just the SEC, EPA, and others. Um, and so I think Commissioner Peirce's view is that, you know, with no specific statutory mandate to adopt these types of rules, um, to, you know, it's all under the umbrella of what's necessary to protect investors, and with such incredible specificity that it's going to be vulnerable to court attack as, um, as you know, beyond the Commission's authority. And, and of course, in every appeal like that, there's also, there also will be an attack on the cost-benefit analysis, that this is incredibly costly to implement, um, and the benefit is, in Commissioner Peirce's view, not clear at all. Melissa, we'll skip you, since these are proposed rules, <laughs> and we'll move on to, Jay, why don't you give your accountant perspective? Yeah, I think, um, I think accountants have been looking for some time for some direct guidance in this area. It's been a topic of conversation, obviously, for several years. It does seem like uh, some of the guidance is starting to come become more clear um, with respect to not just the proposed rule from the SEC, uh, but also from the California legislation, which somewhat mirrors but even uh, takes things a little bit further with respect to scenario analysis. Uh, I think you know I think accountants are heartened by that fact that you know there needs to be muscle memory created on some of these disclosures, whether it's uh, the emission standards, uh, scope one to three, or whether it's actually financial statement footnotes and scenario analysis around climate events and how far you take that. Uh, I think companies can start building out some of their disclosure controls around those areas now in anticipation. Uh, we don't know how soon the SEC's rules are going to become final, but we know California is out there in its legislation. That timing to me is very interesting. It certainly makes it feel like um, the commission is being forced to do something maybe a bit sooner than they were thinking they were going to. Uh, but overall, I think from an accounting perspective, I think at least the fact that there's a little bit more clarity on what's coming is a good thing, and I, can th I think companies can start planning for that. Melissa, tell us about the 
final amendments the commission just adopted in September of 2023 um, on the names rule. Um, so I, I think some people think of this as an ESG role. It, it's not. Th this is about making sure that the name of a fund matches its investment, its strategy, uh, its portfolio, as well as uh, the risk involved. And so I think this is something that just builds on what's been out there for about 20 years at this point in time. Uh, it says that if you say that you're a certain type of fund, you have to have 80% of your investments in that type of uh, investment. Uh, if your strategy claims to be something, it needs to follow that. If you drift, you have 90 days to come back in. Um, I think it's a pretty straightforward way of making sure that investors know what they're getting. We've unfortunately had some instances where people claim one thing and they're actually investing in something else. Um, and that's, I think, as, as has been Described our core business when we have a false statement like that, that that we need to make sure that investors know what they're getting. Steve, what are you hearing about the names rule? So I, I would. This is definitely one where look. There's no question, and I think the rule really says this that it broadens substantially the application of of the rule to. I, I think either the chairman of the rule said something almost three quarters of 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 investment companies. It has broader application, but. They, the, the commission really did um, substantially move away from some of the, I think, the more controversial proposals um, in the final release. There was a lot of uh, what I think people viewed as burdensome monitoring to, to determine um, the the 80 percent threshold um, in really mu you know much finer points than than quarterly, uh, monthly, daily, all kinds of possibilities um, that, that people were really concerned about. And I, I think it, the commission was sensitive to what commentator said in a lot of those areas. In, in, in a lot of ways, they retain some of the original characteristics, I think, of the rule that, as, as Melissa said, is, is 20 years old, um, reporting, uh, not reporting more than quarterly, et cetera. Um, I think there's a few things that, that, that brought, and the other thing that I think was, was really controversial, which was, I think, enormously helpful, uh, where they landed also was they declined to prohibit integration funds from using um, to, to the ESG part of the rule, right? Words like, you know, green, you could, they can still use a green fund, um, sustainability fund, or things of that, of that nature. They're pulled into the rule, of course, and, and there has to be controls to determine, you know, whether it's applicable and how you do that. And so firms will have requirements when they do that, but they're at least permissible. Um, I think one area that remains open um, that people have been thinking about is the, 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 the part that talks about when the name suggests um, that the fund has particular char characteristics of a certain type or a certain nature. And again, this has gotten a, a little bit of extra attention in the ESG space. Um, I think as uh, Commissioner Uaid, I think, pointed this out, which is I don't think that that is one of the areas that I think people had hoped for a little bit more definition, and I think that remains maybe an open question for how the Commission's going to view the particular characteristic standard, and maybe, um, you know, hopefully we'll see that in guidance and or you know, in the exam context before we see it in the enforcement context. One enforcement case, Melissa, just very briefly on the valet case. Uh, can you summarize that for us and then you guys can give us your perspective on where you see enforcement going uh, in this I think area because there hasn't been that much enforcement. So I think valet is a good example of how the commission vindicates things with regard to sustainability reports and misstatements, that you can't go out there and say something that's inaccurate. You, you can't be putting pressure on people to change reports or public statements um, so that you can sell more securities or keep your share price up. That's that's just not allowed. Um, the Valley case, I think, was a good example because it's both E and S. We had pollution, um, people killed, entire communities destroyed as a result of a dam failure. Um, and one of the things that I think is important about this case is it is international. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we haven't maybe talked about as much today. But it, boundaries, we're cross-border now. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, investors and uh, companies across the world um, in our enforcement. Um, and I think in ESG, what's happening in Europe right now, for example, I think impacts companies a tremendous amount as well. And I think that's all in the mix with regard to how we select our cases and then do our enforcement. What are you thinking of from a defense perspective in ESG? Enforcement coming. I mean, we're, there, there haven't been a lot of ESG cases. Um, I say that neutrally. I'm not asking for them. Um, <laughs> but there was certainly a lot of fanfare, I think, uh, a while back, suggesting that the, 
that the division was going to expend a lot of resources on it. I think this is a good example of a case, right, within the wheelhouse of the division. I think some have observed this week when the commission put its exam priorities out, uh, the exams division did, that ESG was not a priority this year uh, for exams. That doesn't mean they're not going to look at it, but it's, it's at least not one of their key priorities. Um, and so I think clients are sensitive to it. I think clients really are very focused on their disclosures and understand it. But the key remains um, for ESG disclosures. I think Melissa's alluding to this rightly. If, if clients are, are making disclosures um, that relate to ESG-related issues, then they're going to need to make sure they have sufficient um, policies and procedures to ensure they understand the accuracy of those statements. And I think when and if the commission or the division finds them, we can expect them to bring those cases. Well, from your perspective, Jay, these... Yeah, I think, you know, one last thought I have on ESG reporting, I think obviously companies need to be thinking about creating committees for advising on the reporting. A great time if a company doesn't have a disclosure committee already, it's a great time to have one between cyber and ESG. I think that's increasingly critical. I think it's also a great place for companies' internal audit teams to play. I've always thought that internal audit tends to be underutilized by most organizations, and this is one with creating that muscle memory and then pressure testing it with internal audit. I think that's a, a great synergy. Melissa, in December of 2022, we had the 10B talking about another rule, the 10B51 trading plans. Can you summarize it from an enforcement perspective and then Rob? Okay. We're in the last four minutes here, so I'll turn it over to the defense attorneys. I won't go very deep. Uh, this is a rule that uh, has been in place for a long time. It's, it's a safe harbor. And in order to take advantage of the safe harbor, it's been made clear that you need to have a cooling off period now. Um, you can only have one policy at a time. Um, you have to enter into the uh, plan uh, on the basis of good faith, and you have to certify to that. And I think that those pieces allow us to be able to evaluate at a company when trading occurs whether or not those things have been met. Rob, what do you think is encouraging to senior executives to enter into these plans? Yeah, the no, I think, it's, I think it's really interesting because if you, if you go back, as Melissa said, the rule is a safe harbor. So what, you know, what's the point of a safe harbor, uh, especially you know, this one in particular? Well, it's to take an area of risk, um, and here the risk is executives trading their own stock, right? Obviously, that's, that's an area where, where you can make a big mistake. So take an area of that risk, and by creating a safe harbor, you do two things. One is you give a safe path to the executives who say, you know, listen, I need to, um, I need to diversify my, my, um, my portfolio. My career already relies on this job. I need to sell some of the company stock. Well, it gives you a safe path to do it. If you do it this way, you'll be okay. And then the other thing I think it does is it helps the market by encouraging good behavior, right? The, the rule says this is the way we want it done, and then people follow it, and it's good for them, and it's good for the market. Um, I think the risk of the way this rule was done and what it, what it requires is it does potentially discourage people from using it, right? The, the, um, the discussion around 10b-51 plans now is so negative, right? Like it's so far removed from the idea of, hey, this is something we want you to do. This is a safe harbor. This is good for you. It's good for the market. All, the, all you hear about it is how they might be being manipulated and you need to do it this way and you need to do it that way. And making it so onerous uh, and negative seeming has the risk that executives just won't use it. I mean, again, it's a safe harbor. You don't have to do it. Um, and, uh, and if they don't do it, that's, that takes you back to the state before there was a safe harbor for them, um, which if they're careful and well advised, they should be fine, but it, it, it makes it harder to use that safe path. And for the market, you have, uh, you have less people doing things the way uh, the market should, should feel good about, and you have less disclosure about it. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it's a new rule. We'll see what happens, but I think that's the risk. Melissa, any reaction to Rob's very reasonable interpretation of the impact <laughs> of the, the um, I think that it's a very important and very good rule. I think it just puts into place what always should have been there. There should have been these cooling off periods from my perspective, and I think letting people know where your risk is if you don't have a cooling off period, if, if you're in possession of information and you put in place and you trade right away, I think you've got more risk. I also think it goes to the market integrity piece that, that Rob was talking about. I think the market wants to know that executives and companies aren't trading with their own shareholders when they 
are in possession of material non-public information. I think that's key to our system and people trusting that it's a fair marketplace, not the Wild West. And so I see the rule as uh, reminding people of how to think about this process. I don't know that it moves the bar in any way, shape, or form. I don't think it changes the way that we will investigate it. I think it signals some of the things that we look at when we're investigating it to suggest that someone's not in good faith or was in possession of material non-public information. Um, but overall, I think it's good and important, um, particularly given all the dialogue that there had been, as Rob was noting, all the negativity around um, companies or, or insiders trading. Um, in the marketplace, which I think was creating a sense of an imbalance of information in an unfair situation. Steve, and Steve wants to say last something. 20 seconds. Of yours. <laughs> 10 seconds on, I've, I've never understood the, the focus on cooling off periods because um, I, I, employees and executives can trade any time during an open window, right? And so if you have, if you certify you have no material non-public information when you enter into a 10B51 plan, then quite, and, and you could trade that day then I'm not really sure I understand why it can't go into effect immediately if you could otherwise trade on the very same day. But I, so I don't know that that, I, I've always wondered why that has become such a really big focus. Uh, the chairman's spoken about it. I know it's in the rule. That's one that I've, I've always wondered about. And that's it. Uh, we're out of time. <laughs> we're going to do the short selling. Right?